Hi everyone, good morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you may be joining us from. And welcome to the UWorld Recording Studio here in Dallas, Texas, where we are live with the Step 1 QBank Masterclass. My name's Simone, I'm on the physician team here at UWorld, and we have pretty much every specialty of physician here, but my particular background is in plastic and reconstructive surgery. And here at UWorld, I contribute to the surgery and anatomy curriculum and also help to onboard some of our newer physician team members. So today, I'm gonna to be helping onboard you to our Step 1 QBank to show you how you can maximize your use of it, both during your preclinical classes, as well as when you get to your dedicated study time for Step 1. Before we begin, a couple housekeeping comments. So to ensure that you have a great viewing experience, please go to your settings and set your video quality to HD. Also, if you should happen to develop any issues with the live stream on your device, uh, we recommend that you refresh your browser and hopefully that will help the live stream come back up. If not, or if you wanna to refer to this masterclass later, we are going to be recording this session. And finally, if you have any questions or comments as I'm going through the talk today, please leave them in the chat and we have a few other team members who will be answering some of those comments as we go, as well as at the end, if we have a little bit of time, I would like to answer some of those questions and answers for you. So let's jump in. So for the last decade or two, uh, the vast majority of medical students have been using UWorld to study for the Step 1, um, and what they've discovered is that it really has helped improve their test scores. This is back when Step 1 was scored. What they've also discovered, though, is that UWorld can be used as a learning tool. So we've gotten a lot of comments, things like, you know, I never really understood that concept until I read your explanation, or I didn't put those pieces from lecture together until I had to do your question. That really reinforces that UWorld is not just a test prep tool, it's a learning tool. This masterclass today is about how you can use UWorld as a learning tool, all alongside your preclinical classes, and then when you get to your step one dedicated study time. Here's a question we get all the time. How should I study? So I'm gonna start by talking about a tried and true strategy that has helped countless medical students succeed. And then I'm gonna dive into the QBank and show you how its features can be used to achieve that strategy. But here's the main takeaway. Start early, practice often, and aim for two times through the QBank. What exactly does that look like in practice? So you may be familiar with the story of the tortoise and the hare from Aesop's fable. In this story, there's a race between the two animals and the hare overestimates his abilities, runs ahead, takes a nap, and then he's still sleeping as the tortoise plods along slow and steady, da-da, da-da, overtakes the hare, wins the race. From this, we get the idiom, slow and steady wins the race. And this is true during the acquisition of knowledge phase when you're in your preclinical classes, but you also need to be able to be like the hare to be speedy when it comes time for test taking. So we recommend that you conceptually separate your QBank usage into two phases. They each have a distinct strategy. During your preclinical classes, you're in your tortoise mode. You're gonna be going through the QBank in a systems-based approach. Match your system to what you're learning in class. Go through slow and steady you'll have more time to spend on those explanations, which we're gonna cover later. During this time, you're really focusing on building your foundation of knowledge. And as you go through the questions, you're gonna get some self-diagnostics. You're gonna figure out what comes more easily to you, what's more challenging. Then, as you transition to your dedicated study time, you can use the QBank in a test-based approach, or the hair mode. Here, you're working on speed. You need to be able to take those questions within the 90 seconds allotted, because that's what you're gonna get on the test. You're also gonna be working on stamina, taking questions back to back to back to simulate the test blocks. During this time, you're also gonna take the questions in a comprehensive mode, right? Mixing them up, like you're gonna see them on the exam. And you're also gonna focus in on those weak areas which you identified during the tortoise phase. So I want you to keep this story in mind because I'm gonna be referring back to it as we dive into the QBank. So let's talk about how you can customize your practice tests for each of the phases that we just mentioned. Practice tests are like the functional unit of the QBank, and there's multiple options by which you can customize them. The first is the test mode. 
So tutor mode, if it's on, is going to show you the explanation right after you answer the question. This is going to give you that immediate feedback. Um, you're going to find out, did you answer the question right or wrong? If you did answer it right, did you answer it right for the right reason? You're also going to get answers for the, for the incorrect uh, answer options, and you can read those explanations too. While you're in test mode, you're going to want to turn this off so that you can take the questions back to back to back without seeing the explanations in between. The next option is timed. If you turn this on, it's going to allot 90 seconds per question averaged over the entire block. That's what you're going to see on the exam. So again, turn that on when you want exam simulation. Turn it off when you're in your learning phase. Next, you have the question mode. And that's which questions are going to populate the test. During the, during the learning phase, you're probably going to want to use the unused questions. But then as you, you know, get closer to your test, whether those are class exams or step one, you may want to switch to you doing tests that just have incorrect or marked questions. Like if you mark questions as difficult as you're going through them the first time. And you'll always have access to all the questions. So some students uh, like to take the questions the first time alongside their classes, and then before they're studying for their class exam, they'll repeat some of those questions. Um, and you'll always have access to them. Next, we have our subjects and systems. So these are made to match the NBME subjects and systems. Uh, but what you'll find is it's really easy to customize them to match a practice test to which you're seeing in class. So you can do that in a couple ways. So first of all, a lot of schools will have a block at the very beginning uh, where it's like a foundations and you're going over some like biochemistry, genetics, things like that. Um, we have these general principles questions um, that you can use so you can start off pretty early in, in your M1 uh, year with a practice test. And then as you move on to systems, you can use these different systems. I'm going to show you how to walk alongside your curriculum. Here's an example of a preclinical curriculum. Now obviously the order of the different uh, blocks is going to vary based on the school, but this gives you a sense of the different systems that you're going to be learning. So let's say that you start out with your circulation and breathing module and you want to use UWorld to follow alongside it. If you go into the QBank under systems, you can go to cardiovascular system. And here you'll find we have 422 questions all about the cardiovascular system. You want to take that at the beginning of your block and divide it by the number of weeks that you're going to be on the block so you know how you can work through them um, and finish them before you get to your exam. And then as far as the order in which you take those questions, um, you'll see that if you hit the plus sign, we divide these into categories. And so let's say that in your system block, you're starting out with the normal structure and function of the cardiovascular system. Well, we have questions for that. Maybe you're talking about congenital heart disease. We have questions for that too. And as you walk through your block, you can take questions that correspond to what you're seeing in class. This is going to help you really reinforce and integrate that material that you're learning. Again, if you move on to your breathing block, we have pulmonary and critical care questions, 259 of those. And again, we've separated those into categories so you can more easily follow along with what you're learning in class. The last way that you can customize the practice test is with the number of questions. So you can put up to 40 questions per block uh, because that's the number of questions that are allowed on a block or that are on a block um, on the step one exam. So you can select up to 40 if you want to simulate the exam or you could do five or 10 questions if you want a more bite-sized uh, practice test. And because you can use UWorld on the go, you can put it on your phone, you can put it on your tablet. Um, you can take these practice tests when you have downtime you know, throughout the day. Also, you know, there are people who tutor medical students and, you know, how to improve their scores and everything, and they actually recommend uh, using maybe five questions at the beginning of a day to, like, jumpstart your brain before you go to lecture. Because another way you can use the questions is to kind of figure out what's highly testable, what's high yield. And so really using them hand in hand with what you're learning uh, in class. Let's jump into a question. So here's an example of a typical step one question. Um, and the first thing you'll note is that it's in clinical vignette form. And there's a couple reasons for this. Uh, the first reason is because that's what you're going to see on your standardized exams. And the second is because it underscores that there actually is a clinical relevance to these basic science principles that you're learning. So let's look at this question. I've highlighted some of the important parts here. We have a woman coming in for a tuberculosis evaluation. 
She's been exposed to tuberculosis from her father, who has active TB, and initially she gets a skin test, which comes back negative. Eight weeks later, she comes back in. She has no symptoms, but her repeat skin test shows skin induration or a positive test. Her chest x-ray is normal. The question is, which of the following immune effector cells are most important for control of the pathogen responsible for this patient's skin findings? So you're gonna think through the answer choices, kind of pick one, and if you're in tutor mode, you'll immediately find out, did I answer this question correctly or not? You'll also see percentages for the other answer choices based on how other students uh, have answered the question. You'll see the amount of time that you spent. Then you'll see the explanation. So over here on the left, you can kind of see the entire explanation laid out, and I'm gonna go through the different components um, as one of the content authors and kind of give you a behind the scenes tour here. So the first thing you see is an illustration, and this is a UWorld illustration that we make here on site. We have medical illustrators here, and as the physician team, we work with them to put these together. What we're trying to do is to take the most high yield information and make it visually pleasing to help you learn because you know the vast majority of us are visual learners. So seeing it in this kind of beautiful picture form can help us remember it. So you're gonna see in this illustration, we have tuberculosis um, and all the way from the time that the contaminated droplets are inhaled, uh, we're gonna show you what immune effector cells are important in controlling the disease. So here we have our macrophages. Um, gonna kind of scroll down. Um, having them migrate to the lymph node. Eventually, we're gonna end up with macrophage activation, which is gonna result in intracellular killing or formation of a granuloma. And along the way, we're showing you um, kind of all of the important uh, molecules that are involved in that too. When we get to the written explanation, uh, UWorld style explanations have three parts. We have the explanation of the correct answer, which you can see here. We also have explanations for each of the incorrect answer options. And here I'd like to just pause and say that when we are creating these incorrect answer options, we are picking things that have a lot of teaching value. So I would pay attention to these even if you get the question right. There's going to be pearls in there that you're going to want to know. The third part of every explanation is the educational objective. And that is a two to three sentence summary of the main points of the explanation. If we go back to the main explanation, I'd like to show you another feature that we uh, include, which is what I call strategic bolding. And that is, if you look at the bolded words, let's look at them together, mycobacterium tuberculosis, interleukin-12, naive CD4 cells, interferon gamma, activation of macrophages. The bolded words are really giving you the main points of this explanation. And what we hope is that by giving you the strategic bolding, by giving you the main answer explanation, by giving you the educational objective, we have told you multiple times what you need to take away from this particular explanation. I call it the triple tell method. It's basically a way of telling you without it really feeling repetitive. Um, and I would argue that there's actually a fourth tell in this one, which is the illustration. Here's another question, um, just to kind of show you something different. Um, in this particular one, we have a 72-year-old man coming in with severe chest tightness and shortness of breath. This is completely new for him. We give you his past medical history, which includes prostate cancer. Uh, and then we show you his chest CT. And what we want you to see here is that he has a saddle pulmonary embolus. And the question asks, which of the following factors most likely contributed to this patient's current condition? And the answer is hypercoagulability uh, because of his cancer. Here, because we know that you're not a radiologist yet, even though some of you may be budding radiologists, we are gonna label all the important anatomy for you. Also, when we get to the incorrect answer choices, for the other diagnoses that you might have chosen, we're gonna show you the same imaging modality and we're gonna label that anatomy for you too, or label the findings for you. We're gonna to stick to one imaging modality per question because what we like to do here at UWorld is take big concepts and break them into bite-sized pieces. So we could show an x-ray, we could show an MRI. You know, we have those different studies in, in um, other questions, uh, but whether it's radiology, histology, pathology, we're gonna limit it to one type of modality per question because it really keeps it from becoming overwhelming. If you see everything all at once, 
overwhelming. If we break it down into bite-sized pieces, that's much more manageable. I also like to point out, so like for the tuberculosis question, we have probably at least 25 questions on tuberculosis in the Step 1 QBank. But what you saw was just the pathogenesis. We'll have other questions that have to do with the uh, drugs that are used to control tuberculosis or what reactivation looks like. Again, we're breaking it down into bite-sized pieces so you can progressively master all the information that you need to know. As you're going through the QBank your first time, we encourage you to create custom flashcards. You can take any of our visual material, written material, and make it into a flashcard. And then once you've made flashcards, uh, you can study them with spaced repetition. So from the flashcards um, tab, you'll see there's a browse and a study area. In the browse area, that's where you can kind of sort through your flashcards, edit them. And then when you go to study, that's where you can study the flashcards with spaced repetition. What that does is it shows you the flashcard and asks you to answer, like how hard was that for me to, to get the flashcard information right? Um, if it was easy, good, or if you need to see it again because it was hard. Space repetition is gonna take those things that are difficult and help you see them more frequently until you master them. And then it's gonna space it out. Like if you answered easy, you're not gonna see it for a while. So that's gonna challenge your brain to really retain that information. Another feature we have is called My Notebook. And so as you're going through, uh, you could either create flashcards or you could take the same visual or written information and add it to this electronic notebook. Um, and if you do that during your first pass, it's gonna be available for you later uh, when you get to your dedicated study time. A few other features, um, when you log in to UWorld, you'll see your dashboard. This is gonna help you keep track of your progress and your performance. It's also gonna show you how many seconds you're spending on each question. Remember the benchmark is 90 seconds. That's how long the NBME gives you. Averaged out over the block, you get 90 seconds per question. And so you can see your average time spent. Now I wanna reinforce that when you're going through in your tortoise mode, it doesn't really matter how long you're spending. Um, and it also doesn't really matter your performance. And I'll touch on that later. But what you're really focused on there is learning, reading those explanations, looking up things that are knowledge gaps. Um, when these statistics matter is when you're in that hair mode, when you're in that test prep mode. So what a lot of students do and what we recommend is that you reset your QBank in between the two modes. When you reset the QBank, you're gonna keep all your flashcards, keep your My Notebook, but it's gonna reset all of these statistics so that when you go through that second time, you'll be able to see okay, how much time am I spending? Am I under the 90 seconds? You'll be able to see your performance. And to speak of performance, you'll be able to break it down by subject and system. And even further, you'll be able to break it down by category. So now I'd like to talk about a few common obstacles that students face uh, when they're using the QBank. The first is wanting to master the material first. And this is pretty common because we're, I know we're all like a little bit type A, maybe a lot type A, <laughs> speaking for myself. Um, we want to come into a test fully prepared, and sometimes that can look like, you know, rereading a textbook and can look like rewatching a lecture, um, wanting to, to enter the QBank fully having mastered the material. That would be fine if there was an unlimited amount of time, right? But we don't have an unlimited amount of time. And I imagine that you may already be, already be triaging your time. You might be kind of pulling back in certain hobbies, not spending as much time in certain relationships because you have to use it to study. And so using the QBank is a really effective and efficient way to learn the information. It's active learning. Um, it's gonna keep you alert uh, when you're studying. And um, so we recommend that you don't show up having mastered the material first, you get exposed to the material, you use the QBank and kind of do this upward cycle, basically, of using the QBank to help you master the material. The second common obstacle is getting questions wrong. And by this, I don't actually mean that the getting questions wrong is, is the bad thing. Um, it's our desire to not want to get questions wrong. Um, so this is related to the first obstacle, but it kind of has to do with like the feelings uh, that we have when we're, you know, taking a practice test in the QBank. Um, and I'd like you to think of a time when maybe you got called on in class and you answered a question wrong and you felt embarrassed. Um, 
what did you do after that? Well, you probably went and looked up that information and your mind like put a death grip on that inter- information like you never forgot it, right? So getting questions wrong can actually help you master the information um, even if it doesn't feel good. And I kind of have a personal story about this. Um, when I was studying for the plastic surgery oral boards, which are the last step to board certification and they come after the written boards, they're this, you know, at that time it was a two day exam, multiple sessions where these like rookie plastic surgeons like myself would be grilled by these master plastic surgeons about our cases from our first year of practice as well as from unknown cases that cover the whole gamut of plastic surgery. Well, to study for this exam, which is unlike one I had ever taken before, you had to actually answer things out loud, um, they recommended that we get into these study groups with other rookie plastic surgeons who were taking the exam. And we had to practice showing each other pictures or giving like clinical scenarios and answering out loud. What would we do from start to finish? What would we do with certain complications? And I often got things wrong in front of my peers and that was embarrassing, right? Like I had to say, oh, I don't, I don't know, I'm gonna have to look that up. Or, you know, because you have your adrenaline going, um, you don't answer as well as you might like to. Um, but because I got things wrong in that low stake setting, I was ready when I got to the high stake setting of the oral boards and ultimately past the boards. Um, so the Q-Bank can be that low stake setting for you where you're encountering this information Maybe you get it wrong the first time, but that's so you can get it right when it really counts, whether that's your class exams or your step one exam. The last obstacle is starting the QBank too late. And I think this one's relatively self-explanatory, but I will mention that there are 3,700 questions in the step one QBank. That's a lot of questions if you're waiting till your dedicated study time, which is why we recommend that you don't wait till your dedicated study time. Um, If you think about 3,700 questions, if you were to divide that over 37 weeks, right, that's like 100 questions a week. If you double the number of weeks, it's only 50 questions a week. It becomes much more manageable to get through the material. So you don't want to get overwhelmed when you enter your dedicated study time. So that brings me to our recap. How should I study? Start early, practice often, and aim for two times through the QBank. That first time through the QBank is gonna be during your classwork in that slow and steady tortoise mode. That's gonna help you build your foundation of knowledge. Then you're gonna switch during your dedicated study time to focusing on speed and stamina, that hair mode. That's gonna help provide exam simulation for you. I also will mention here that during your dedicated study time, we have a couple simulation exams. The simulation exams are four blocks of 40 questions each, so 160 questions each, and each of those is separate from the the questions that are in the regular QBank. So there'll be fresh questions for you um, to kind of see where you're at. Uh, Maybe you take one when you're starting your dedicated study time and take another one two thirds of the way through, something like that. So you can really see your breakdown on performance and use it to help you tweak what you're studying during your dedicated study period. Finally, as you're going through your first pass, we recommend that you customize your QBank by using flashcards or my notebook. Get all of these resources ready so that when it comes time for your dedicated study time, you already have them. You can use them to study. It's gonna make it much more efficient and effective. Okay, that ends the presentation part. And now, um, hopefully we'll be able to take some questions. I've got to sign in here and get the questions. Okay, so one of the first questions that we have is, should the uh, system-wise study be done after finishing the system block, like in classes, or do it simultaneous with the system block? Um, What I think I would recommend is that you do it simultaneous with it, just because, as we saw, there were like a lot of questions in that cardiology block. Um, An approach might be that when you cover the material in class, you know, you go home and find that category and then cover that material in the questions. Um, Another approach, like I mentioned, there are, you know, physician tutors who recommend maybe doing 
kind of splitting it, like doing five questions in the morning of what you are going to see in class and then kind of doing the remainder after you've experienced the material just to kind of like wake up your brain and, and motivate you to like pay more attention um, during your classes. So there's different ways to do it, but I wouldn't wait until you get all the way to the end of the system block because that's a lot of questions to go through. Just to give you an idea, the, the, if you do like a 40 question block, which is, you know, what's on the exam, but Again, you don't have to do them all at once when you're in your, in your classes, but if you do 40 questions, that's 60 minutes. A lot of people say that it takes them like two or three hours to really read through those explanations for those 40 questions. So when we have, you know, a hundred, not hundreds of questions in the cardiovascular system, I can't remember the, off the top of my head how many it was, but it was a lot. It was like well, 374 or something like that. That would take a lot of time if you were to wait all the way till the end. So use them as you're going through your system, kind of matching the categories to what you're learning in class. That's what I would recommend. Okay, how much time should one take to review a block of 40 questions on UWorld? Like, should it be fast or slow? Sometimes it takes three to four hours per review. Yeah, that I didn't. That's like oh, that's what I was just saying. Um, but uh, if you're in your your tortoise mode, remember the time doesn't really matter um, because obviously it, it matters as far as like how you're triaging your time for study, but as far as like whether you're hitting 90 seconds per question and, and, and doing that 40 question block in 60 seconds, that doesn't, that doesn't matter so much. Um, you probably won't be keeping track of the time as much if you're in the like tutor mode and untimed, you'll just be kind of going through getting the explanation right after you answered that question. Um, but yes, I would say that it's probably realistic to estimate three to four hours when you include doing 40 questions and reading the explanations um, for them uh, when you're in that kind of tortoise mode phase. When you get to your dedicated study time and you're you know, mixing up the questions um, and doing them comprehensively because that's what you're gonna see on the exam, um, at that point, hopefully you've, you've read our explanations before and you've already kind of gleaned information from them and you can read them a little bit faster that second time around. Um, if you're really triaging, you know, like maybe uh, really read in depth the ones that you get incorrect and skim the ones that you got correct. So hopefully the second time around, it's not gonna take you quite as long. Um, let's see, how to make UWorld notes. Which part should I note down? It's taking too long. Um, you know, that, that's gonna vary by person. I mean, everybody is slightly different as far as their note taking uh, goes. If you feel like you're having to triage your time, it might make sense to take notes about the things that you struggle with. And that way you can go back to those uh, when, later during your dedicated study time. You know, if you have all the time in the world, uh, you can take notes about everything. Um, but if you're struggling, then I would say focus in on the things that are hard for you or that you're getting incorrect and write notes about that because that's the material that you're really gonna need to kind of hone in on, on on your second pass. Okay. How much time should I devote to the Q Bank during medical school and during dedicated study? Um, we have a favorite thing here at UWorld where we say, oh, well, it depends. Like we say that a lot around here. And I feel like it, it does depend. And so I'm just gonna give you some general principles for this. I mean, obviously that depends on what other things you have going on in your life. You know, like if you have a family and you have other responsibilities, you know, that's gonna eat into some of your study time. And, you know, life is important. So um, keeping that in mind, uh, I think you'll find that if you start UWorld early, um, you'll find it to be a really great learning tool. And it's actually gonna be pretty effective and efficient, which is why we keep saying, you know, start early, start early. Um, because also, like I mentioned, if you have 3,700 questions and you're dividing them over, let's say, 74 weeks. Okay, so if it's 37 weeks, it's 100 questions a week. 74 weeks, it's 50 questions a week. Well, 74 weeks, you know, 52 weeks in a year. You know, if you start during your M1 year, by the time you're getting to step one, you've already covered all of the questions. And 50 questions in a week, you know, where we calculated 40 questions might be three to four hours, then a little bit more than that, right? Maybe four hours or so to do those 50 questions. Considering how high yield um, your learning is gonna be from these questions, it is a worthwhile investment. And I think most people can find four hours somewhere in their study time in a given week uh, during their M1 and M2 years. So 
that's kind of the, the basic principle with starting early is to make it much more manageable. Okay, let's see. Okay, another question, should I start out using another QBank and then switch to UWorld during dedicated? Um, I know that, you know, people choose to do that for various reasons. I mean, I may be a little biased because I work at UWorld, but um, we really feel like we are the gold standard for preparation, but also for learning. So I would think if I had like my best resource that I wouldn't want to wait until the very end to use it because I wouldn't be able to glean as much from it. So I like to say, you know, take your best resource, use it early and use it often. Um, and because our explanations really are so high yield as far as their teaching, I just wouldn't want to wait to experience them in my dedicated study time. So regardless of whether you use other resources, we do recommend that you start UWorld early, um, just so that you can really maximize your use of it. Um, I think you'd be kind of cutting yourself short if you, if you wait. Okay, question here, how should students use the UWorld question bank if they're only using it during dedicated study time? All right, so even if that's not the best case scenario, we know that that, that can be a scenario. Um, so if you're doing it during dedicated study time, you're really gonna have to plan to be able to get through all the questions. Um, so, you know, at the beginning, take them and spread them out over, you know, I don't know how long you have, six weeks, maybe spread them out over five weeks. So you can save that final week for reviewing the ones that you got incorrect or marked as difficult. So try to get through a full pass during your dedicated study time. Um, and at that point, you know, you're really triaging your time. And so you'll wanna really focus in on the ones that you're getting incorrect or wrong. Um, you're reading through those pretty thoroughly, filling in your knowledge gaps. Um, if you're getting them right, I still recommend that you read the explanations because they're so high yield and the wrong answer explanations, but you may want to read those a little bit more quickly. You know, if you got the answer right for the right reasons, then you're just going to need to kind of figure out uh, how to manage your time a little bit better. Um, and I think I mentioned also the self-assessments. You'll want to fit those in. Um, a lot of people take one at the very beginning because there are diagnostics that come with those self-assessments. Um, we still do give a three-digit score. That's because people like to know like where they're at. You know, Even though the step one is not scored anymore, if we just said pass-fail, like you don't really know, like say you failed, like how close you are to a pass, that type of thing. So with the self-assessment, you'll get some diagnostics. You'll also get that performance breakdown. That's gonna help you tweak your study schedule um, for the rest of your dedicated study time. Oh, and just to follow up on that, there was a question about the format of the scores on the self-assessments, which I just mentioned. Um, yes, it's still a three-digit score estimate. The reason why is because if somebody fails, it's, it's kind of good for them to know by how much they did. Um, is there a plan to change it to align with the transition to pass-fail? We are considering that. You know, the scoring um, is still kind of changing as far as what they're setting as the benchmarks for pass and fail. So we're going to take a look at that. Uh, over the next year or two as some of that data starts coming in um, and we'll reevaluate if we should give a pass fail on the self-assessment if we should give a pass fail on a three-digit score like you know how we want to do that um, but we want to help you learn and so right now we feel like that information is still helpful for students which is why we haven't transitioned to just a straight pass fail and we're also wanting to be you know consistent with whatever data comes from the NBME and that is forthcoming as they have just changed the uh, the type of the exam to, to pass fail. Okay, is there a way to have automatic highlighting applied to passages within the question content without manually applying it yourself? So the answer to that is no, and we do have a good reason for that. Um, so what this is talking about is um, there are some other QBanks out there where there's a feature, you push a button and it basically highlights all of the important clinical clues. And we always are thinking about, well, how can we make our product better for our users? And so we think about this type of stuff. Um, the reason why we don't do that is because we feel that it would be really easy to become dependent on that. And so like an analogy that I can give for that is, you know, if you think about people who are bicycling, now they have bicycles that have these electronic motors, you know, attached to them. And you know that can be good for getting from point A to point B, but you're not really having to work on your power or your speed or your stamina 
when you're going up that hill if you can just like kick your electric motor on, right? And so the QBank is a learning tool. You're learning the information, but you're also learning how to take the test. And so we're leaving off that electric motor so that you have to build your legs underneath you, so to speak, and be able to answer the questions uh, without the help of automatic highlighting. What I will say you can do is, um, one of our explanation features is there's split screen explanations. So if you go to settings, you'll see, uh, you can toggle split screen, split screen explanations on. And basically, as we go through the explanation, we're gonna tell you which clinical clues were important to answer the question correctly. So you can look at the question, look at the explanation, and look back and see if you missed any of the clinical clues. And so we feel that that's a good way for you to be able to kind of develop that in your head um, without having a button uh, to push. Okay. Um, how do I go through the UWorld questions? What do I do after I review them? Should I be saving them or making flashcards? Um, well, I think I've kind of covered the general strategy for how to go through the UWorld questions. Best to start early, best to go alongside your systems, um, doing systems-based questions when you're in classes, switching over to comprehensive review uh, once you're in your dedicated study time. Um, after you review them, you know, if you have the luxury of going through them the first time during your classes, that's when you make the flashcards. Um, with the flashcards, you know, I know that there are these pre-populated decks that are out there, but I feel like the flashcards that benefit you the most are the things that you struggle with um, when you're covering that material, and then you're using the spaced repetition to study it, you know, kind of like one-stop shop, all within UWorld. So I highly recommend that at the least, you make flashcards based on the things that you got wrong, and then use the space repetition during that you know period of time we're in your tortoise phase, so that hopefully by the time you get to dedicated, you're not getting that stuff wrong anymore. Um, and those flashcards are you're hitting easy and they're really spaced out. Um, that's that's really an effective way to use them. Okay. Um, a question here. Uh, why do Kaplan and AMBOSS allow sorting questions by question difficulty, but UWorld does not? Again, we, um, you know, we think about these different features, and the answer for that is because we don't feel like in our QBank, question difficulty really corresponds to, okay, like if it's easy, you have to know that information. If it's hard, that's like for the top 10% of students to know. It's not like that. We write our questions to be primarily a learning tool. And like I mentioned with tuberculosis, you know, there's 25 questions or more that cover the topic. There's varying levels of difficulty within that topic, but the level of difficulty doesn't really correspond to like your need to know or not need to know. We think all of our information is high yield and, um, you know, it's broken into bite-sized pieces, but it is all high yield. And so we can't really stratify them into easy, medium, and hard. Um, it's just really not the way that question writing works. We also don't want to give people like a false sense of security if they're getting the easy and medium ones right. You know, there's a lot of things that go into this. So um, one thing I will say about UWorld questions is uh, they are known to be like sort of difficult. Um, they're usually at or above the difficulty level of the exam. So, um, you know, if, if you're mastering our questions, you're gonna be in good shape, um, probably for the exam, but they're just not stratified into like easy, medium, and hard. That's not how we write the questions. Okay. Um, I think our last question is gonna be, is UWorld enough to pass step one? Ooh, that's kind of a tough one. I mean, we think we are probably the best resource, but whether it's enough, I mean, as you're going through, we know that there are other resources that people like to use. Like a lot of people will have a supplemental pathology resource um, that they'll use. They'll often have, you know, I mean, I know first aid's been around for a long time. We're not trying to replace those resources. Um, we think we're probably the only Q bank that you need to use. Um, but that's just because uh, we cover basically with our questions the entirety of what you're gonna need for step one. So that's why we recommend starting early, 
practicing often um, because if you can master the information that we present to you, um, then you would have basically the QBank resource that you need um, for step one. Um, somebody says they don't like using multiple resources. Um, so yeah, I would start with UWorld um, and then kind of use some of these other things to supplement, especially if you need to fill in, you know, loopholes uh, in your knowledge or loop gaps in your knowledge, things like that. Okay, let me see if there are any additional questions. Okay, I think that's it. Um, I wanna say thank you for joining us for our masterclass today and wish you the very best of luck with all your studies. Thank you. <laughs>